antimicrobials. Any kind of chemical that's capable of inhibiting the growth or stopping the growth of various microorganisms. We could easily say that Paul Ehrlich is the reason that we have most of the antimicrobials that we have today. And in fact, most of the staining techniques, the gram stain technique, the technique of staining to reveal the organisms that cause tuberculosis, all began with some of the histologic or tissue stains that Paul Ehrlich developed in the mid to late 1800s. His early work with staining of tissues led to the eventual investigation into how chemicals could attach to or bind to cellular materials or tissues. And in fact, he also worked on different kinds of products produced in the human body or animals that could also inhibit or prevent the growth of unwanted microorganisms. His concepts with the staining techniques and working with the other kinds of materials from animal and humans that would inhibit the growth of microorganisms led him to propose that there was a magic bullet or chemical that could either be found in an organism, like a, an animal or a person, or it could be manufactured, a chemical of some sort, that could serve as a magic bullet that would target an unwanted microorganism, such as a bacterium, and kill that bacterium, prevent it from growing and causing infection. His work early on caught the attention of Robert Koch. Robert Koch is often considered one of the originators of bacteriology. Many of the techniques that we use in the laboratory today are due to the same types of techniques that Robert Koch developed in, again, the mid to late 1800s. Robert Koch and Paul Ehrlich were collaborator collaborators and worked together trying to determine different kinds of treatments that could be used to help patients get better or recover from infections quicker using either some type of chemical or some kind of special body fluid extracted from one patient to treat another. Eventually, in 1910, Robert Koch and Paul Ehrlich and a team of scientists working together evaluated numerous different kinds of chemicals and found that one particular chemical, salvaricin, was very effective at inhibiting the growth of the organism that caused syphilis. Up until that time, the only effective treatment for syphilis was essentially very toxic mercuric compounds that caused often very unwanted adverse side effects. So, salvaricin had very minimal side effects, could be synthesized in the laboratory, and was very effective at curing patients of their syphilitic condition. Now, Paul Ehrlich is the person who coined the term chemotherapy, that we could have some kind of therapeutic material to treat infection. Now, we move ahead in time, about 20 or 30 years, from the time that Paul Ehrlich realized that there were certain types of chemicals that could be synthesized in the laboratory that could attach to cells and we could use them for staining, that there were chemicals that could be produced in animals and humans that could prevent the growth of unwanted microorganisms, and that they could also develop or synthesize antimicrobials in the laboratory that could also inhibit the growth of unwanted microorganisms that were causing infection. In the 1920s, a microbiologist by the name of Alexander Fleming was also similarly working on isolating, isolating and identifying different kinds of chemicals that could control the growth of microorganisms, bacteria in particular. In 
realized that there was an enzyme that could be extracted from human body fluids, tears, saliva, most mucous membrane secretions. It can even be found in quantities high enough to detect in raw egg white. I mean, that's called, the enzyme was called lysozyme. Lysozyme is an enzyme that will break down the cell wall material of bacteria, which we call peptidoglycan. It's part of the reason that it's probably found in various body secretions is because it's a fairly good defense mechanism. We're going to see later on when we talk about immunity that lysozyme is considered to be a defense mechanism. It helps protect our eyes and our body fluids, it will help protect us against the growth of unwanted organisms simply by using the lysozyme to break down peptidoglycan of bacteria. Well, in 1928, Dr. Fleming was working with various cultures of bacteria, including Staphylococcus aureus. Staphylococcus aureus is a gram-positive coxy, commonly associated with a wide variety of infections in humans, particularly wound infections, abscesses, carbuncles, all kinds of body tissue infections. Even in the 1920s, Staph aureus was a problem. It can also cause infections in animals. So it's very important for us to prevent and control these unwanted infections, particularly in wounds. So we have cultures of Staph aureus, and Fleming was working, trying to figure out ways of controlling the growth. And one day, the story goes, that he came into his laboratory and found a culture of Staph aureus that was sitting near a window. Now at the time, in the 1920s, facilities didn't have air conditioning. So in the summertime, or if it was a little too warm in the laboratory, they actually opened the windows to allow breezes through. And it's thought that through the window and through some of the breezes, even though he had lids on his petri dishes, it just perchance a little bit of mold started growing on one of his plates of Staph aureus. When he looked at it, he noticed that there were no colonies of bacteria growing up around the mold. He identified the mold as a genus called Penicillium, and he named the chemical that was being secreted by the Penicillium mold penicillin. He realized that this was a fairly important discovery, wrote a paper and got the paper published in 1928, and that's pretty much where that information sat on a shelf for about 10 years. We move ahead in time again, about 10 years, to about 1938. And 1938, 1939, we start to see, at least in Europe, the advent of World War II, particularly the conflict between Germany and Great Britain. There were always investigations and interests into ways to treat wound infections whether it was a civilian wound or that found in a soldier. And with the advent of World War II, it was quickly realized that somehow, some method of controlling the occurrence of infections in soldiers was going to be vitally important for the war effort. Now, some of the synthetic antimicrobials that were created by Paul Ehrlich and other types of chemists were being used, typically in the form of sulfa drugs. Sulfa powder was often packaged and given to the troops to take with them on the battlefield. Well, that worked perfectly well, but then scientists realized, especially some that had recognized and remembered Alexander Fleming's paper from 1928, that perhaps this chemical from this mold that Dr. Fleming had discovered might be even better than the synthetic antimicrobials that were being used in the early stages and early months 
of World War II. The early discovery, the first form of penicillin discovered, was not very stable, and it was in very low quantities, about four units per milliliter, which is very, very low concentration. Ernest Chain, who was a biochemist, working with pathologists and physicians like Howard Florey, worked diligently for many months trying to enrich and improve the yield of penicillin produced by the molds and to determine what was essentially the proper dosage. Remember, they didn't have the kinds of agencies that we have today that could perform various types of clinical trials and measurements and analyses. They were pretty much sort of often doing just sort of trial and error on just the few patients that they could find with the little amount of penicillin that they had. So sure enough, eventually it was determined that it could, in fact, be a very effective antibiotic. An antibiotic is a term that we're going to use to mean a chemical produced by a mold to inhibit or kill bacteria. And sure enough, penicillin early on in the early 1940s proved to be very powerful and very valuable to treat infections, especially wound infections, in soldiers. After several months of intensive research and, and essentially growing the penicillin in various all kinds of devices. The mold penicillium was grown in every kind of bottle and device and any kind of container they could find. In fact, the old-fashioned bedpans, oddly enough, um, had sort of a, just the right shape and design that they could grow the mold um, in the entire surface of the bedpan on the lid, they just tried to produce as much as possible, and of course the best possible culture material would be growing the mold in a liquid broth so you could easily extract the penicillin from that liquid. Well, they searched for better producers, they looked for penicillin produced from a penicillium strain that was in higher quantities or higher concentrations than the original that was discovered by Alexander Fleming. They took the molds to the United States to try and get the drug companies in the U.S. to start to produce and help Great Britain in the production of the antibiotic. All kinds of rapid advances were, were done or taken place early on in the 1940s during World War II. And in fact, once production got significantly higher, the troops benefited because many soldiers who would not have returned or survived World War II did so because of the use of penicillin. And for decades after World War II, penicillin was considered quite the wonder drug because it was very effective at preventing unwanted infection. The species of penicillium that Alexander Fleming discovered producing penicillin was a strain of penicillium notatum. Much like the center photo, the colony of mold is producing penicillin that's inhibiting or preventing the growth of the Staphylococcus aureus bacteria up close to the mold colony. It's similar to what Fleming saw in that original first agar plate of the mold bacterial colonies. Now, the chemical structure of penicillin illustrated on the right demonstrates an important part of that chemical structure that we call the beta-lactam ring. The beta-lactam ring is a critical part of this antibiotic that is essentially going to be used to interfere with the structure of the bacterial cell wall that we call peptidoglycan. Penicillin prevents the cross-linking and essentially the formation of a nice sturdy 
peptidoglycan layer on the outer surface of the bacteria. It weakens it so much that eventually the bacterial cells essentially just explode or they bust open. So as it turns out, Fleming discovered and worked with two distinctly different kinds of chemicals that would interfere with peptidoglycan. Penicillin prevents peptidoglycan synthesis or inhibits cell wall synthesis is often the phrase that we use. And lysozyme is an enzyme that interferes with and breaks down peptidoglycan. Now notice the structure and the sporulating structures of penicillium in the lower left photo. When you take a look at penicillium through the microscope, it very much looks like a paintbrush. And in fact, that's where we get the word penicillium. It's derived from the Latin word penicillus, or paintbrush. And when we stain it, we look at it through the microscope, it's very distinctive. There's no missing which kind of mold we're working with. Now, the original penicillium notatum only produced about four units per milliliter of culture of penicillin that could be used for treatment. Way too low for any effective use, and in fact, they had to do a lot of concentrating, a lot of recycling. It was It's a very interesting history, just all about penicillin. So the search was on once sort of production and the manufacturing of penicillin started to take off in the early 1940s for strains or other kinds of penicillium species that could produce even more or higher quantities of penicillin. And sure enough, in Peoria, Illinois, a housewife, because the, the call went out from all the drug companies that were manufacturing penicillin, for people to please send in their samples of molds that they would discover on their fruits and vegetables. And sure enough, a Peoria, Illinois housewife found a blue-green mold on a cantaloupe, sent it in to the drug companies. It turned out to be a very prolific producer of penicillin, much higher quantity. And now, the strains of penicillium that are being used in manufacturing penicillin today easily produce 50,000 units per milliliter of penicillin. Unfortunately, because of drug resistance, now penicillin as an antibiotic is almost exclusively of historical importance. And we don't have too many real applications, and the effectiveness of penicillin in treating infections is just a distant memory. But when we first discovered, or when scientists first discovered in and medical folks start to first use penicillin, it was an, almost amazing, it was unheard of that a patient with essentially a lethal infection put, could be given a dose of this chemical and the physicians and the nurses could literally watch the patient get well just by simply giving the patient this antibiotic.